good evening welcome to this webinar so one of the things that uh, we thought we should be doing is um, i thought it would be good for women to listen to you know why they get investigations done once you get pregnant one of the things in the journey of pregnancy is that some of it, testing is non negotiable it's inevitable and these investigations are planned to improve your outcomes in pregnancy can everyone hear me can somebody just say yes in the you know chat box are you able to hear me okay that's good i can see the yes in the chat box okay so this is also we are specifically you know looking at women and we are targeting small populations now somebody who's come has had a pregnancy confirmed what happens then you know what are the investigations that we advise you to undergo in pregnancy and what is the rationale between these behind these tests because usually you get a list from us get these tests done and you know come back with the results normally all investigations in pregnancy have a definite purpose so they help in diagnosing conditions or problems which will be detrimental either to the out outcome of pregnancy in terms of you know bad outcomes to the mother or to the baby and we can't pick up these just by clinical examination we can't pick up these just by clinical examination so we need to do certain tests only then we'll be able to you know um, tell you some reasonable conclusions and if these conditions that we are looking for are picked up in a timely manner then the outcomes of pregnancy will definitely change and you know you, you, women will come out better for it and so will the baby so let's look at what are the tests that we advise so these tests there, there are tests that we do specifically to look at the health of the mother and you can see these this, this is i think a familiar list a lot of you must have seen this list and uh, so usually we ask for a blood group and rhesus type a complete blood picture complete urine examination thyroid testing blood sugar testing and a specific test called hplc so why do we do these tests let's go into the rationale of every investigation and why we are doing these tests now if you look at blood group so all of us know that we have a specific blood group there are eight possible blood groups you can see they are displayed over here you can have o a b a b and this can be there are two rhesus types and that's what makes it eight four subtypes of blood groups when you add it with the rhesus type it is positive or negative you can either have an o negative blood group or o positive a negative or a positive b negative or b positive ab negative or ab positive somebody has typed that they can't see can you see now i have adjusted my camera okay so if you look at the blood groups one you know simple reason why we do blood grouping is that pregnancy particularly labor and delivery is a condition which is associated with blood loss bleeding during labor and delivery is non negotiable everyone bleeds and sometimes there may be a necessity to give a blood transfusion so whenever we need to give a blood transfusion it's very important to know what the blood group of the donor is and what the blood group of the recipient is so that we can give compatible blood transfusions now this holds very commonly for all procedures you know if you're going in for any surgery other than pregnancy and delivery also you have a blood group testing and this is the reason and we also you know the compatibility match i have given and that's a very technical thing you don't need to bother about it but one specific reason why we test for blood group and rhesus type very early on in pregnancy i mean you know we can do if it's only for the purposes of blood transfusion we can check your blood group when you're in labor also but we do that right at the beginning these are called booking investigations the list that i have showed you that means as soon as your pregnancy is diagnosed when we do a viability scan and we find that you're carrying a healthy pregnancy we automatically ask you to get these tests done and uh, so the reason why we do the blood group very early on in pregnancy is that we want to check for what is called the rhesus factor now this rhesus factor is what makes your blood group negative or positive if your if your blood group is a the presence or absence of the rhesus factor is what makes you negative or positive so if you have a rhesus factor you are rhesus positive 
if you don't have a rhesus factor and this is an antigen this is very genetically inherited you become rhesus negative so in what way what are the implications of this rhesus positive and rhesus negative and why should we know about it very early on in pregnancy so if you look the rhesus status actually matters if the pregnant woman is rhesus negative if the pregnant woman is rhesus negative and if the fetus she is carrying is rhesus positive and this can happen if you know the husband if the father is positive mother is negative it's very likely that the baby can inherit the father's blood group and can have a positive blood group now if the baby has a positive blood group sometimes some of the blood cells from the baby from the unborn baby that is the fetus can get into the blood stream of the woman who is rhesus negative so what then happens is that because these antigens are strange to her body i mean these are foreign antigens she does not carry the rhesus factor and when these when this rhesus positive blood cells come into her blood stream she recognizes this rhesus positive as a foreign antigen and her body automatically produces antibodies if she is positive baby is positive even if these positive antigens come into her blood stream she is not going to respond but if she is negative and she gets these positive antigens from the baby's blood the mother's immune system comes into play and then you know it she starts producing antibodies and this may not even be such a dangerous thing in the first pregnancy because the most common time that the baby's blood you know travels into the mother's blood stream is at the time of labor and delivery you know the blood from the baby which is rhesus positive goes via the placenta into the mother and the mother then develops antibodies and this happens most commonly at the time of birth the problem is that these antibodies if they persist in the mother's body and if she has a second pregnancy where the baby is again rhesus positive then these antibodies what they do is that their job is to go and attack the positive cells and where are the positive cells they are there in the baby so they go across the placenta attack the baby's positive red blood cells and when the baby loses red blood cells the baby can develop severe anemia and this is called hemolytic disease of the newborn so this kind of anemia can be life threatening to the baby right within the womb of the baby so this needs to be avoided like i said it's not really a dangerous situation in the first pregnancy but in subsequent pregnancies this can happen however the other times that this kind of transmission of the baby's blood into the mother's blood stream can happen even without labor and delivery that can happen during a miscarriage or abortion or if there's some vaginal bleeding during pregnancy so how do we prevent this from happening so how what can we do we just basically what we have to ensure is that the mother should not get any antibodies she should not develop any antibodies against this positive cells so how do we achieve that we achieve that by giving her an immunoglobulin it's almost like a vaccination but this what it does is the opposite it prevents antibodies from forming it binds with the baby's positive cells and prevents antibodies in the mother from forming so it's extremely important that when a rhesus negative mother delivers it's very important to test the blood group of the baby and if the baby is rhesus positive the mother needs to be given this anti d immunoglobulin well within 48 to 72 hours after delivery to prevent the antibody response thus the mother remain the babies remain safe in all subsequent pregnancies there's no antibody response also if the woman develops any of these potentially sensitizing events which i was speaking about like you know if she has some vaginal bleeding or if she has had a miscarriage or if she's had some invasive procedure during pregnancy for different reasons then we should remember that we should give this anti d right when that process happens because otherwise even this pregnancy is at risk so the blood group and rhesus type in a pregnant woman is very important for these reasons you know and we we kind of diagnose it we do this investigation very early on so that we can 
pick up the blood group and follow up the woman in an appropriate manner. Even in a woman who's pregnant for the first time, if she's got a negative blood group and she develops bleeding during pregnancy for some reason, or you know she has a miscarriage, unfortunately, we have to ensure that she gets this antibody so that we can protect the future pregnancies. Now, in fact, it's being recommended that all pregnant women should get a course of antibody during pregnancy itself, even in the absence of sensitizing events. And this is something which is a very strong recommendation because sometimes it's very hard to pick up small, minor sensitizing events. And it has been found in scientific literature that despite the absence of these sensitizing events, sometimes the mothers can develop antibodies. So we're recommending this to be given during pregnancy. So if your is negative, we ensure that you get a dose of this antibody at 28 weeks. And in some women, we repeat it again at 32 weeks of pregnancy. So this is the importance of checking for the blood group. One is, you know, if you ever require a blood transfusion, we know that, you know, we know your blood group and we know what blood type to ask for for you. And the other, the more important reason is the rhesus status. Now, the next investigation that we commonly advise is what is called a complete blood picture. Now, this happens like early on. The, all these investigations which I'm talking about are investigations which are happening right in the first trimester of your pregnancy. That is, you know, you've been diagnosed to be pregnant. We've confirmed that you have a healthy pregnancy through an ultrasound scan, which is called the viability scan. And this is something that all of you would have come and had. And then we give you this list of investigations. Now, this complete blood picture. Basically, we do the complete blood picture for two factors. One, the more important factor is to diagnose any form of anemia. By anemia, what I mean is that there is a lack of, your blood has something called red blood cells. These red blood cells contain a molecule called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the molecule which carries oxygen to different parts of your body and also through the placenta to your baby. So if your hemoglobin is low, which is how we diagnose anemia, then this is what the WHO has recommended, that the normal levels at 12 weeks should be at least 12.2, at 24 weeks should be 11.6, and at 40 weeks should be 12.6. So if your hemoglobin levels are low, what it means is that your oxygen carrying capacity of the blood has reduced, which means that it can cause problems to you, it can cause problems to the baby. And it needs investigation and anemia can cause, you know, it causes tiredness, weakness, lack of immunity in you. It predisposes you to develop what is called preeclampsia, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and you have an increased incidence of urinary tract infections. If you're anemic, the baby can, we may not grow as well as it should grow. It's called growth restriction. And also, there's an increased risk of having a preterm delivery with anemia. If your hemoglobin level is very low, there's an increased risk of having cardiac failure in you. So it has a twofold impact. You know, it can cause you, it, it can cause impact on you, it can cause impact on the developing fetus. And so it's very important that we need to investigate this anemia and correct it. Now, the other issue that I spoke to you about, you know, the fact that when you deliver, you know, whatever be the mode of delivery, whether it's a normal delivery or a cesarean section, Bleeding is completely non-negotiable. And uh, if, if you go into labor or if you go in for your cesarean section with very good levels of hemoglobin, whatever be the bleeding, your body will be able to withstand that and will be able to compensate. But if you go into labor for your delivery with a low hemoglobin and you bleed, then your body may decompensate and may require blood transfusions. And that's something that we try to avoid as much as possible. And in this day and age with the COVID around, we are also finding it very challenging to actually you know, give blood transfusions. So there's a large window of opportunity in pregnancy to improve 
pure hemoglobin. And that happens through a combination of supplements. Once we know what the cause is, whether it's iron deficiency, whether it's vitamin B12 deficiency, then we can correct it. And there's ample time for us to be able to correct it through, you know, giving you good supplements and a good diet. So it's important that you do this test. The other parameter we look for in this test is what is called the platelet count. And in this platelet count, this indicates to us your clotting ability. And in some women, just pregnancy itself causes the platelet count to drop. And we like to kind of work on that and improve it. So this is about your complete blood picture. Now, the other specific test that we recommend is called hemoglobin electrophoresis. And this is an extension of our evaluation for anemia. But this is important because we are screening for some congenital conditions, particularly a condition called beta thalassemia. India lies in the belt for increased risk of beta thalassemia. This is an inherited disorder of hemoglobin synthesis. So the body is unable to actually manufacture hemoglobin appropriately when you have beta thalassemia. And because it's an inherited condition, there is a great likelihood that you may pass it on to your baby. And it's important that we have to investigate this so that we can give you appropriate choices, you know, because if the baby has beta thalassemia major, it can be a very debilitating disorder. So hemoglobin electrophoresis is very important because it's very easy to make an early diagnosis of this condition and to see, you know, what are the risks that your baby may face if you have beta thalassemia. Next comes a urine examination. We ask for a complete urine examination and a urine culture and sensitivity. This is because in pregnancy, you may have a condition called asymptomatic bacteriuria. That means there may be bacteria in your urinary bladder, but you may not actually have the typical symptoms of a urinary tract infection like burning in the urine or pain while passing urine. Frequency, increased frequency, you know, passing urine, more number of times happens even because of pregnancy and sometimes we may not actually put it down to a bladder infection even when you're having a bladder infection so it's important because if you have asymptomatic bacteria if there is a colonization of bacteria in your bladder and even if you don't have symptoms there is a possibility that this can turn into a full-fledged infection and this full-fledged infections increase the risk of sepsis in you and increase the risk of preterm delivery in the baby. In pregnancy, the other reason why we are proactive about picking this up early is that we are very limited with the medications that we can give you in pregnancy. You know, because once you get pregnant, there are only certain medications that we can give you. And we can't give you all the medicines that we can give when you are non-pregnant, which may be far more effective in treating that bladder infection quickly. So the earlier we pick it up, the better it is because we may need to use very milder form of antibiotics which are completely safe in pregnancy. So this is a simple urine sample you have to give. It takes about two days for the reports to come. We also test for thyroid hormone. Now, this is an important test in pregnancy because about 3% of the women, you know, who are in the childbearing age group, that is young women in the reproductive age group, tend to have hypothyroidism. But many symptoms of hypothyroidism are similar to that of pregnancy, fatigue, weight gain, absence of periods. And so oftentimes this disease is left undetected and also untreated. If it is untreated, it can have an impact on the baby because while the fetus is developing in the first few months of pregnancy, it relies heavily on the mother for thyroid hormone. So they play a crucial role in the normal brain development of the body and of the baby, of the baby, I'm sorry. They play a crucial role in the normal brain development in the early weeks of pregnancy of the fetal brain. So if you deprive this developing fetus of maternal thyroid hormones, it can have negative effects. So it's important that we diagnose this and correct it quickly. If you can correct it quickly, usually, you know, the outcomes are very good. We also test for blood sugars because in pregnancy, there's a condition called gestational diabetes and this affects about 4% of the pregnant women. Now, what happens is that as the hormone levels in your body rise, the blood sugars tend to get abnormal. It has an impact on the sugar metabolism and they tend to become higher. And this is just like diabetes when you have high levels of blood sugar. 
and these blood sugar actually can cross the placenta and can impact the baby. So it's important that at regular intervals, you have to have your blood sugars tested. And the first point of contact is at this point of time, at seven to eight weeks after you have your viability scan, we also check for the blood sugar. The number of viral infections we test for hepatitis particularly because it can have potentially serious effects which affect both the mother and the baby and it can be passed on from the mother to the baby and it's also important that if you want to optimize outcomes we may have to vaccinate the baby quickly at birth so we can detect these infections in the mother's blood similar is the case with hiv because they can be asymptomatic and once you, you know, diagnose it, there is a, there's a lot of treatment available now for these conditions. And VDRL tests for syphilis, which is also a sexually transmitted disease. And if the mothers are impacted, the babies can be badly affected if it is left untreated. But the same condition, if it is treated, really shows excellent outcomes. Now, these are all the mother's investigations that we advise in early part of pregnancy. Once you get these reports, the doctor usually discusses the reports with you. If they are normal, you don't require any additional supplementation. But if any abnormality is picked up, obviously, you know, the doctor will have a detailed discussion. If any further investigations are required, we advise them and treat you appropriately. It's important that we pick up all these conditions early because most of them, have, as you've seen, have, you know, good outcomes if treated well. If they have poor outcomes on the baby you also have better choices in early pregnancy as to what you can do what about the baby how do we investigate the baby's well-being in the first trimester of pregnancy when i say first trimester i mean the first three months about 13 completed weeks of pregnancy approximately that's how we kind of look at the first trimester so what, what investigations would, would we be doing to check whether the baby is fine? So one of the first things we do is the viability scan. You know that once you have been diagnosed, you know, once you have a positive pregnancy test, it means that you are pregnant. The home pregnancy kits are fairly reliable now. They're quite sensitive. So if you have a positive pregnancy test, it means that you're pregnant. The next step is to make sure that you have a healthy pregnancy. And the only way we can do that is by doing an ultrasound scan. And when we do the ultrasound scan, we like to do it somewhere around seven weeks of pregnancy because you don't want to do it too early. Neither do you want to delay it too late. So around seven weeks of pregnancy is when we advise this viability scan. And this viability scan actually will tell us, you know, how big the baby is, how far on the pregnancy is, how many weeks pregnant you are, how many babies are there? Do you by any chance have twins or triplets? You know, that's that can be picked up at this scan. And it's also useful to check that the pregnancy is within the uterus and not outside, which is called an ectopic pregnancy, which can be quite dangerous. Okay. So this is the first scan that you have in pregnancy. And once you have your viability scan, we get your blood, blood work done. Once you have the blood test done, the next thing that we or tell you once we discuss your blood and urine tests is we say, okay, the next scan is called an NT scan. So what do we want to know further? We want to know, you know, what, what is it about the health of the baby that we want to check in the first trimester? We want to be sure of the dates so that we know when your expected date of delivery is. We want to look at the fetal heart and look at the fetal heart rate. We want to know how many babies are there. We also want to use this opportunity to detect any gross abnormalities in the fetus. And the two important specific conditions that we are looking for at this point is to look for any risk for chromosomal disorders, particularly Down syndrome, and to look whether the mother has any increased risk for developing preeclampsia, that is increased blood pressure, which can lead to fetal growth restriction. And as a consequence of that, the baby may be delivered early. So these are the important health aspects of the fetus that we are looking for. And how do we achieve this? We achieve this through a combination of an ultrasound scan and a blood test, which is called a double marker test. Both of these are combined together. That is, you know, we have the reports of your blood test. We do the ultrasound scan. These are put into a computer program and they come up with results. And that's why this is called first trimester combined screening test. 
And we usually like to do this between 12 to 13 weeks of pregnancy. Ideally, between 12 to 13 weeks of pregnancy for the ultrasound scan. The blood test can be done anywhere between 10 to 13 weeks. But now, because of the pandemic, we are trying to reduce visits as much as possible. So we are combining both the tests and doing them between 12 to 13 weeks. That is, you'll have your ultrasound scan, you'll give the blood sample for your test, and the reports then get available a week later, which the doctor will discuss with you. So it reduces your you know, frequency of visits to the hospital. You don't have to come at a separate time to do the blood test and then at a separate time to do your ultrasound scan. So ideally now we are combining both into one test. The only thing is that when you do it simultaneously on the same day, you will have to wait for about a week for the final report to come. The advantage of having you know, done the blood test say by around 10 weeks or 11 weeks and coming for your scan on the by the 12th week, you could then, you know, combine both the uh, reports and give the final report on the same day itself. But that's, you know, neither here nor there. It's far better to have less frequent visits now. So this is what it is. So these, remember that this test that what we do, the NT scan or the nuchal translucency scan along with the double marker is only a screening test. It only tells us whether your baby has an increased risk for developing Down syndrome. It doesn't tell us whether the baby has Down syndrome or not. And this is something that you need to understand. We also give you an information leaflet, that's why, before you come for the test, because sometimes it's very confusing. You know, people think that they're going to get a diagnosis. This is only going to screen and classify your baby into high risk for Down syndrome or low risk for Down syndrome. If the baby is at low risk, it means that it's very unlikely that your baby will have Down syndrome. But it doesn't mean that your baby won't have. But the likelihood is so low that, you know, because of the various scientific parameters, there are certain points of cutoff beyond which we don't advise any further investigations. But if the risk is high, obviously, you know, you have to do something. So remember, this is a screening test. And once you've had your scan, when your doctor tells you that the baby is at a higher risk, it doesn't mean that the baby has Down syndrome. It just means that we have to evaluate further to ensure the baby doesn't have or to confirm that the baby has so that then you can make reasonable choices. So, it, so this is risk assessment and it's not a diagnostic test. So why, why do we need to diagnose Down syndrome? So basically, Down syndrome is a chromosomal aberration. All of us have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So each pair has two chromosomes. But in Down syndrome, the chromosome 21, instead of having a pair, will have three copies. And uh, so then what happens is that there are three copies of chromosome 21. And this leads to a lot of intellectual disability in the baby. These babies tend to have extremely low IQs, and there's no cure for Down syndrome. They may also have other medical problems which involve the heart, digestive tract. So the features of Down syndrome are not possible to pick up on the ultrasound scan. I mean, I've put them up here. I mean, an ultrasound scan cannot diagnose Down syndrome. And hence, doing this blood test is extremely important because Combining this blood test, looking at the nuchal translucency, then putting a risk assessment will let us know whether the baby has increased risk for Down syndrome. And then the other screening test that we are performing is for any risk, increased risk of preeclampsia in the mother, which is hypertension in the mother. Because if this happens, the baby is automatically at risk for developing what is called growth restriction. That is the baby will not grow to its full potential. will be a smaller baby and smaller babies have many problems. And also if it's uncontrolled hypertension, there is a possibility that we have to deliver early and that can lead to prematurity. So again, we this risk assessment happens through this double marker and through looking at what is called uterine artery dopplers at this NT scan. They look at various parameters and then they can say that the mother is screen positive for preeclampsia and hence the baby is at a higher risk for growth restriction, higher risk for preterm birth. So if 
what are the interventions that we advise? If there's a high risk for Down syndrome, we advise a blood test called NIPS, and we are actually going to do a webinar next week about what is NIPS, what is mid trimester and long scan. And if the mother is deemed to be at higher risk for preeclampsia, then we advise aspirin prophylaxis. Aspirin is a tablet that we prescribe in a certain dose to reduce this risk of preeclampsia. And then automatically you reduce the risk of growth restriction in the baby and premature birth. So these are the investigations that we are routinely advising women uh, when they come in the first trimester. And we just thought it would be a good idea to, you know, uh, talk about these in a way in which it is understandable and easily interpretable for you. So that's me. We are done. And I'm happy to take questions. They've actually started coming. So is NT scan important in the 12th week and why? So I just spoke about it. That's a particular gestation at which you know you can interpret the scan at its best. If you cross that gestation, then we won't be able to make any appropriate interpretation. And that's the time frame that is recommended for NT scan. Can we take iron tablets if we have anemia in the first three months? So they're not unsafe. Iron tablets are not unsafe. But remember, if you have anemia, we have to give you iron tablets in higher doses. And uh, iron tablets cause a lot of severe gastrointestinal side effects. And in early pregnancy, in the first trimester of pregnancy, you're already troubled by a lot of side effects like nausea, vomiting, uh, and uh, in bloating. If you start taking iron tablets, the bloating can increase. There can be more constipation. So usually we reserve iron tablets to be started in the second trimester. But if the anemia is pretty severe, then we start supplementing early on itself and we'll see how tolerant you are to these tablets if you are intolerant to them then you know we probably will have to shift to another form are scans safe in the first three months is there any number of scans we should do like i said the essential scans in pregnancy in the first three months are the viability scan and the nt scan they are safe and you know all the fetal medicine department has certain safety norms that they use in setting the scan parameters. And so they, they use those and do it safely and scans are safe in pregnancy. And remember that one of the things is we also have to analyze, um, you know, the risk benefit analysis. So why are we doing the scan? What information is it going to give us? Is this information going to change the course of my pregnancy quite dramatically if something is picked up? And if I don't do the scan, what will happen? What, what is the uncertainty that I have to live with? So these, these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves because all these investigations are optional as long as you understand the reasons why we are doing them. And you know, if you're willing to forego that knowledge and carry on with pregnancy, it's fine that they're safe. And... Um, Supplements in the first trimester of pregnancy. I think the only thing now we are recommending is folic acid because folic acid is absolutely essential. In fact, women should start taking folic acid right from when they start planning a pregnancy. And uh, colloquially, it's called the engagement pill. That is, you know, in fact, governments, certain governments have policies in place that, you know, women who get engaged should start taking folic acid because folic acid is absolutely essential for the early development of the uh, brain and spinal cord of the fetus. And normally we tend to pick up pregnancies when, you know, you've missed your period, you've waited about two weeks, then they've come, done the pregnancy test. So through all that period, folic acid is essential. So if you start taking folic acid right when, um, you know, you're planning a pregnancy, that's the best thing and you'll have to continue it through the first three months. What medications can be taken for vomitings? Now, that's interesting. So, nausea and vomiting in pregnancy is usually your body's response to the increasing hormone levels in your pregnancy. So, there are certain hormones which increase in large quantities when you're pregnant and your body is not used to these hormones. They're there only when you're pregnant. 
especially if it is the first time that you're getting pregnant, your body has never even seen these hormones ever before. And they rise at a very, very rapid pace. They rise million fold in early pregnancy. And it's like, you know, if you get admitted to the hospital for some thickness and they give you large doses of IV medications, strong medications, what happens to you? You start throwing up, you become sick, you become weak. That's exactly the impact of these rising hormones in pregnancy on your body. They're good, good for the development of the pregnancy, but they cause these problems. So when you have nausea and vomiting in early pregnancy, it's useful that so in the first three months of pregnancy, we are also extremely cautious or, you know, we are very conservative with medications. We give only those which are absolutely essential. So any problem that you develop, if it is manageable with lifestyle alterations, we say that's the first thing that you should do. So for nausea and vomiting and right from when your pregnancy is diagnosed, it's a good idea to eat small meals at frequent intervals. Make sure that you're eating small quantities. Make sure that you're eating every two hours. You know, your uh, interval between meals should not be more than two to two and a half hours. Otherwise, it will lead to a lot of bloating and discomfort. Eat whatever you feel like. Don't force yourself to eat food that you don't feel like eating because you feel you're going to lose out in some way. You're going to miss out on nutritious food. That's not going to happen in the first trimester. If you eat food that you don't like, most likely you'll throw up. And that's, you know... Now, it's counterproductive. So eat what you feel like, even if you're eating the same thing repetitively. Sucking on something sour helps a lot with nausea. For some reason, when you generate sour saliva, your nausea center is impacted and you tend to feel less nauseous. So maybe you can suck on a piece of lime, gooseberry, amla, or you know you can eat, eat imli toffees or suck on tamarind. That also helps. And... Um, if you fill a bowl full of food, you'll feel like throwing up. But if you take smaller portion and just okay. So, and if all these don't work, then we recommend certain medications and you can take them. Uh, and but medications have to be completely prescribed by doctors under supervision of doctors. Is it safe we take any medicine for vomiting and nausea before every meal in the first trimester? I just answered that, I think. Feeling uneasy and vomitings, the same thing. I've gone through that in a lot of detail. I'm four months pregnant. PSH is high. I don't have history of thyroid. So I think the most important thing here is that if you have not had any history of hypothyroidism, this is the first test that is shown up as abnormal, you need to consult an endocrinologist or a physician. That's extremely important because they may want to repeat certain tests and actually look for certain other values like 3, T4, which indicate to us what is happening and then only start treatment. So we need to be sure that you really have hypothyroidism. Any injection in the first trimester, flu vaccination. You can take flu vaccination in the first trimester. It's, you know, flu vaccination is now routinely recommended in pregnancy. Can you hear me now? Somebody has typed that they can't hear me. Okay. Chances of normal delivery the second time when you've had a C-section during first delivery. While this is not connected to what we're talking about. Yes, this is called vaginal birth after cesarean section. It's very possible, but it has to be individualized that decision. You know, you'll have to discuss this with your doctor. A lot of it depends upon why you had your previous cesarean section. What is the interval between, you know, what is the duration since when you had the previous cesarean section? Has there been enough time for the scar to heal? How is the course of your pregnancy this time? Will it permit for you to have a cesarean section? Like, is the baby's position good? Is the weight fine? After this, the doctor will discuss with you what are the risks involved in trying for a normal delivery after you've had a cesarean section and what are the absolute prerequisites of doing that. And we do try for normal deliveries after a cesarean section and there's about a 60% chance of having a success, but you should keep an open mind that your chances of having a cesarean section will be higher than that of a person who's had a previous normal delivery. But it is very possible, but it, this has to be individualized. You know, this treatment has to be. We did a blood test and the count is 9.5. I'm assuming that is hemoglobin. The count being 9.5. There's a question here which says, we, we did a blood test 
and the count is 9.5 what type of food would you recommend and when should we have so first of all when your how when your hemoglobin is 9.5 we need to establish why you are having this hemoglobin of 9.5 is it iron deficiency is there a vitamin b12 deficiency or do you have any inherited form of hemoglobinopathy which i was talking about like beta thalassemia so we need to first identify the cause and depending on the cause definitely you know you need to eat you need supplements also if there's an iron deficiency you need iron supplements if there's a b12 deficiency you need vitamin b12 supplements and you will need a diet which is rich in iron and vitamins and normally when you have vitamin b12 or iron deficiency you will need to consult a professional dietitian they will talk to you about the foods that are rich in iron and vitamin b12 commonly we know things like green leafy vegetables green beans all colored vegetables have high quantity of iron cooking again iron vessels improves and obviously red meat is an excellent source of iron beetroots are good sources of iron but i would still recommend a committed consultation with a dietitian with a structured diet sheet the reason is that then you it's not vague you know these are the foods that increase iron content so i'm going to eat lots of them which is not the answer you will have a better idea and a reference point what about tt injection tt injection we usually give around 16 weeks and then we are suggesting that you take tdap uh, around 29 weeks of pregnancy travel safety in pregnancy so in pregnancy you see the fundamental thing you must remember is that you should ask yourself is travel essential don't do it unless it's absolutely essential if it's essential you can travel right up to say 34 or 35 weeks of pregnancy the safest time is second trimester that is you know after your 14th week and before 28th or 29th week the important things you should remember about travel is that some ground rules the shortest route is the safest route so whatever takes you in the shortest form to your destination that is the safest form make sure that you have your medications with you make sure that you know you carry your pregnancy records in case something happens and most importantly make sure that the destination you are traveling to has good healthcare facilities and you know where to go if there's an emergency so these are the specific precautions you have to take but you always have to ask yourself is it essential and then you know you can do the travel i think we have done quite a few questions now and um, there aren't any more also so may i log off we are done even in terms of the time i think we are like 45 minutes into this again i am seeing here we cannot hear you can you hear me yeah okay cramps in the first trimester sorry if i didn't address them so any form of pain if it's just simple cramping which comes and goes you can ignore it but if there is cramping pain associated with bleeding then obviously you have to consult the doctor so thank you very much for joining us i hope this was useful we are planning to do this every week you know talk about simple things in pregnancy that you are recommended and it's important that you understand why we are doing all these things okay thank you ladies